So we are now going through in John chapter 15, corroborative passages elsewhere, especially in uh, the Gospels, that provide fellowship, abiding in, that are discipleship type passages which are very often confused and even forced to be salvation passages. You have to do all of these things. He who has found his life shall lose it, in Matthew 10, 9. And he who has lost his life for my sake shall find it. That's not a salvation passage. And Matthew 16, 21, from that time Jesus Christ began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and raised up on the last day, on the third day. So all these things. Now we get down to... Everyone, therefore, who shall confess me before men, I will also confess him before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever shall deny me before men, I will also deny him before my Father, him before my Father who is in heaven. And for the Son of Man is going to come in the glory of his Father with his angels and will then recompense every man according to his deeds. In Mark 8.38, Luke 9.26, for whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will also be ashamed of him when he comes in the glory of his Father with holy angels. This, this is discipleship, and for being a disciple in this temporal life, you get rewarded. But if you're not, you also uh, are ashamed, get ashamed. Whoever is ashamed of me in this temporal life, who are, whichever believer, this is not for salvation. Mark and Luke state a negative condition that if anyone is is ashamed of Christ and his words, Christ will also be ashamed of that person at his coming. Matthew 16, 27 does not mention shame, but can be correlated with Matthew 10, 32 to 33, where the condition is stated in terms of confessing and denying Christ. So the shame seems to imply a denial of one's identification with Christ in the face of the pressure to live for and identify with this world. Is there not pressure every day? Just turn on that TV set. Just go out there and do some shopping talk to people or your neighbors and you find the pressures are everywhere and it's it's a matter of consciously resisting and moving toward discipleship and away from those things that, that draw you in they're they're attractive temporal uh, pleasures but they don't provide for eternal rewards and lasting conditions because the more pleasure you go in a temporal sense and seek the more, more is never enough and all of a sudden you find at the end of your life you can't do those things you could do when you were younger and you miss those and you reminisce about the joy that you had when you were a little boy or little girl and and uh, you did those wonderful things at birthday parties and you miss those things when you get older because your friends get older and they die sooner or whatever uh, they don't they, they separate from you get in, attached to something eternal that'll pr provide for you for your future <clears throat> work toward the future now at my age, I look to eternity. I don't look to what I can do next month or a new career. Second Timothy 2.12 If we, believers, endure, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. So Jesus' teaching on discipleship took place well into his ministry and was addressed primarily to his disciples as a further revelation of the kind of commitment he desired of his already saved followers. He explained these conditions against the background of his own commitment that would lead to his death in order to invest them with the fullest significance in this temporal life for those who are also desired to follow God's will. There's a desire, and then there's the enablement. Where does the enablement begin? Prayer, studying God's word, moving away from those things, confession of sins, moving away from those things that will are only temporal, and a short-lived, and you won't enjoy them as you keep on doing more is never enough. And there's always some new thing out there that promises some greater ec ecstatic joy, but the, the, the careful, planned Christian life, as directed by especially the study of the Word of God in the epistles, Matthew 10, 37, He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. That's a pretty radical statement, but think about it. Who's your creator? What's your purpose? We're all in this temporal life as believers in a temporal sense and not in a perfect one. Go to the perfect word of God and get your direction corrected. And you'll help your family as well. 
and you'll end up loving your father and mother more, but less than Christ. Because loving Christ more and obedience be, be, to him is a, a redirection to your family of doing the same thing for eternal rewards and eternal life. Luke 14, 26. If anyone comes to me and does not hate, and by comparison of his love for me, and Luke 14, 26. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. That's pretty radical. But you turn your life toward those things, your creator, and so much the more then your temporal life will be enhanced for your family and others, your brothers and sisters in Christ. Matthew 10, 37, he who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. That's pretty radical. I hate your family. Well, it's a comparative thing. Pastor Bing says, we must be unquestionably loyal to him. This interpretation does not apply to the unsaved, for one more naturally learns love and loyalty on the basis of what Jesus has done in redemption and forgiveness. That's Nothing is surpassing that. The Bible teaches that God offers salvation to people as sinners, that is, apart from their love and loyalty to Christ. Romans 5, 6 to 8, for while we were still helpless, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly, that's us. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. 1 John 4, 10, look at all this corroboration. The value of the Christian life begins at the point of faith alone in Christ alone and must be enhanced. It's hard work and difficult, but then you get the inner joy of this uh, eternal direction and not a temporal one that soon fades as you grow older, especially. 1 John 4.10, in this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Even thus softened as a Semitic figure of speech, such a devoted love for God over blood relationships would be an extraordinary demand for unsaved sinners who have had no experience of Christ's redeeming love. You get the experience by getting your nose in the Bible, confess sins, and recognizing and being compliant with the redirection within you of the Holy Spirit toward what you have learned in God's Word. Furthermore, it cannot speak of salvation because Matthew records that any loyalty that preempts loyalty to Christ makes or shows one to be not worthy of Christ. The statement about unworthiness seems to imply the converse, that one can be worthy of Christ. However, the unsaved are unworthy of Christ and his salvation because they do not believe, not because they are loyal to family ahead of Christ. I've heard this many times. I'm a good person, I'm good with my family, and so on and so forth, but you're turning your back on Christ, so you're not worthy of him. Get a higher plane of worthiness with God, and you have a higher plane of worthiness with your family. Conversely, no amount of loyalty to God or any other form of good deeds makes a sinner worthy of Christ's righteousness. One can only be worthy for rewards. And even that, God blesses the rewards, perfects them. Hey, wouldn't stubble are burned up, but the gold, silver, and precious stones, the value of your life you serve the Lord with in his temporal life, are purified all the more, refined and rewarded to you all the more. Like the previous demands, this demand cannot speak of salvation. It is truth which brings sal believers into a deeper relationship with Jesus as Lord through their loyalty to him. All of this, and we're still in John 15, 3 to 5, corroborating it throughout the Old and the New Testaments, especially now in the Gospels. You are already clean, Jesus told the disciples, because of the word I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I abide in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. And notice the vine dresser is going to prone and dress, and, and that's going to be difficult in this Christian life. But then you produce all the more fruit, and for which there is eternal joy, how long is eternity? You have that joy forever. Temple things will pass away. New heavens and a new earth will give all a greater eternity. True believers may not abide in Christ, and then they will suffer the consequence of loss 
of eternal rewards but not loss of salvation. When they don't, and when they don't abide in Christ, they will suffer the consequence of loss of eternal rewards but not loss of salvation. I must repeat that. Scripture also teaches of the possibility that true believers who are secure in their eternal life may even be assured of it, may not abide in Christ. There's a lot of stuff out there in the world that just flashes things to attract you toward. You will just waste your time in one direction, then that, that time it could have been spent in an eternal direction. So obey our Lord's commandments and produce divine good works. Fruit for the kingdom of God and there will be consequences. So if you don't do the obedience, and here's the, uh, the disobedience side of it. Excerpts from Galatians chapter 5. Galatians 3, 5, 13 to 26. Believers are called to freedom, only they are not to turn their freedom into an opportunity for the flesh in the sense of re-enslaving themselves to their sin natures, going back to enjoy for the flesh and the pan things in his temporal life, or worse. But through agape, godly, self-sacrificial love, believers are to serve in the sense of being in servitude to one another. Read these verses, Galatians 5, 13 to 26. For you were called to freedom, bro brethren, only to, to do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word, in the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. As Spirit is directed through your study of God's Word, through the Holy Spirit dwelling in you. It's all set in place for you just to simply follow, but make the effort. For the flesh desires what is against the Spirit, and the Spirit desires what is against the flesh. They are opposed to each other, so that you don't do what you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under law. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, sexuality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, it's a bad list, disputes, selfish ambitions, dissensions, factions, heresies, envying, drunkenness, carousing, carousing, and things like these of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you before, that the, those who practice such things, and when they gave them a, a, a terrible list, those who practice such, such, such things will not Inherit the kingdom of God. Key word here is inherit. Doesn't mean enter into and reside in. It means inherit. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. One direction or the other. If, since, we live by the Spirit, let us also walk. We should walk by the Spirit. It's a possibility. Subjunctive mood here. Let us not become boastful, provoking one another, envying one another. So believers are called to freedom only. They are not to turn their freedom into an opportunity for the flesh in the sense of re-enslaving themselves to their sin natures, but through agape, godly, self-sacrificial love. And believers are to serve in the sense of being in servitude to one another, in servitude to the Lord and in servitude thus, in servitude to one another, fellow believers, and fellow men who are unbelievers to serve them especially relative to the gospel. For you were called to freedom, brethren, only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. Galatians 5.1a It was for freedom that Christ set us free. The first phrase of Galatians 5.1, it was for freedom that Christ set us free, is a summary statement of the content of chapters 3 and 4 of Galatians, of hopeless bondage to law, human doing, versus achieving freedom in Christ via faith alone and Christ alone, apart from human doing, in order to be justified before God unto eternal life. As we mentioned this before, there are all kinds of bonding you can get by the way your life is directed. If it's in the temporal life, there's a bondage, and it's often 
the, the formula of more is never enough, <clears throat> the more power.